The most important current that connects the North Pacific and the Arctic is the, the current that flows north through Bering Strait. And that current is enormous. It's like having 50 or 100 Mississippi rivers flowing northward between the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea. On average, there's about 0.8 sphere drips coming in, and a sphere drip is 10 to the sixth cubic meters per second. It's just some big oceanographic unit of water flow. So that's a significant amount of water. And that's forced by a sea level height difference between the North Pacific and the Arctic Ocean. The North Pacific is about half a meter higher. So there is a net flow north through Bering Strait. And so we need to provide that as a boundary condition. Bering Strait is the choke point between the Pacific Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. And it's at a critical juncture for Earth climate processes. It's, it's a really important point for the, the, the globe as a whole. And how wide is the Bering Strait? About 80 kilometers wide and about 50 meters deep. So not that deep? It's not that deep. It's shallow and it's narrow. It's a, it's a short little jaunt between Asia and North America there. I'm not a modeler. I'm an observationalist who likes to use the model output. So Kate is the modeler and she generates these numerical simulations that I combine with my observational data and I compare against my observational data to make an assessment of how well the model is working. We can use the model to either prove or disprove some of his theories of what the circulation is doing and why. Once you have confidence in what the model does, you can use it to fill in those gaps where you don't have actual observations. And so the role of the computational science is, is to allow us to build these models to, to simulate what's going on. In the, and so we can look at the model and see the full 3D picture as it, and see it evolve with time as well. And so to help understand what could be happening. We'll go out there in the summer months, because that's when you can get to these places, deploy moorings, for instance, that are anchored to the bottom, and leave them there. Come back a year later, and with acoustics, trigger a release mechanism, and what happens is the anchor is let go of, the floats on the mooring bring everything up to the surface, and you pick it up, and then you can retrieve your data. We know that the water fluid motion is described by the Navier-Stokes equations. And those equations have terms such as viscosity and we call it advection, which is how you carry particle properties along as the water moves. And so you advect things like temperature and salinity and the motion itself. That the velocity momentum itself is advected. And there's wind forcing and, and temperature forcing. The flow heading northward through Bering Strait into the Arctic Ocean is a first order contribution to the Arctic Ocean fresh water budget. And that's important because the Pacific water coming through Bering Strait helps to cap the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean from the warm Atlantic water down below. So that helps keep the sea ice on top of the Arctic Ocean. And then the water, which is relatively fresh, coming northward through Bering Strait, comes into the Arctic, and eventually it makes its way to the North Atlantic. And the North Atlantic is where the global ocean circulation is primarily modulated from. And that flow can be slowed down with the export of fresh water from the Arctic, a large portion of which originally came from Bering Strait. So the climate model itself consists of an ocean model, an atmospheric model, an ice model, and a land surface model. Those are the four basic components. So what we're bringing in is a regional ocean model that has to talk to the global ocean model. So there's a strong connection between the world's ocean currents and what comes through Bering Strait. That's one of the controls on climate that Bering Strait offers for the global weather. And we're also adding things like ecosystem components so in the ocean model, it's not just the physical fields. We have different options for running what are called NPZ models, nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton. The simplest of those models had just those three components. But the new ones are up, you know, like 
12, 15 different components of zooplankton, phytoplankton, and detritus and different limiting nutrients. There's flow that can happen between the basin and the shelf all along that shelf. So it's, it's a complicated system, but there are modes of circulation that are preferred for the shelf. And these are driven by the winds, the sea level height difference between the Pacific and the Arctic, and, and the tides primarily. We had some ideas about how the winds were pushing the waters around, but our analyses more recently have shown that it's much more of an interconnected system than we had thought initially. Rebecca Woodgate has had a mooring out in the Bering Strait for many years, and Seth took her data and correlated it with the winds, and then from that he could produce an estimate of the th Bering Strait th through flow. So that's a boundary condition on my model, is how much water's coming in through the Bering Strait. And it is a function of what the winds are doing. The winds can push. Interesting about Bering Strait is that the winds have the ability to reverse the flow in Bering Strait every once in a while when they blow strongly enough. So if you want to get the circulation right in the Chukchi Sea in a model, you need to be able to get both the standard flow that's forced by the sea surface height difference correct, and you also have to get the wind-driven portion correct. The prevailing winds in the Chukchi Sea are from the northeast, so they're opposing that flow. The flow is usually against the winds. If the winds blow stronger than, say, 15 or 20 knots for long enough, then it could probably reverse the flow. Mm -hmm.